Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Amaria O'Leary. I'm a member of the Zumbro Choir and very proud to be a member of the Choral Arts Ensemble Board of Directors. We have a wonderful treat today. Dr. Rick Kavam, Artistic Director, is here to tell us about not only the upcoming concert, but Bach's <laughs> wonderful mass in B minor, which is going to be presented by an expanded choir and orchestra the weekend of the 14th and the 15th. Performances are at Assisi Heights, 7.30 and 4 o'clock, Saturday and Sunday. Rick will do a pre-concert lecture a half an hour before each of the concerts. This is a very complicated work and it can be very intimidating for some of us who don't know as much about music as we probably should. So we're very <laughs> pleased to have Rick here today. I hope you will help me in welcoming Dr. Rick Kavan. Thank you. Okay, I've never worn one of these, so this is a new thing for me. A couple new things for me here. Um, the, there's a um, quote from uh, Albert Einstein famously wrote, whoops, in a um, margin of some book. Uh, I can't remember it exactly, but it's, uh, as, as far as box music, this is what I have to say. Um, look, study practice, play, revere, and keep your trap shut, or something, something like that. So it's with some risk that I feel like I'm going to talk about Bach here, but uh, it, it is true. I hope we'll mostly just listen to music, uh, and uh, because the music speaks more than anything I'm going to say. Um, we are doing this uh, performance March 14th and 15th up at CC Heights with a marvelous uh, Baroque orchestra terrific wind players in town, and we've imported a few uh, others, and uh, 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 we've expanded the choir. We did it in 1988, so this is a, our second viewing of it. Uh, I see a couple of people who were in that group back then, um, yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a, a labor of love for both the singers and the instrumentalists. Some of them, you know, like the horn players never played the horn solo in the quonium, which is the most perilous, you know, one piece that you, a horn player sits there for an hour and a half and then plays like crazy for three minutes and he's done, you know. And, but it's a fantastic movement. And uh, similarly for the bassoons, there's a bassoon duet in, the, in that same piece. And so they're all excited to come play because they don't get to do it every day. It's not in standard repertoire. Um, uh, so, but it's, uh, this is a setting of the ordinary of the mass. You know, the part that doesn't shift from week to week, the, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, and the Agnus Dei. And uh, it's a little odd for a Lutheran like uh, a Bach to set a Mass, a Misa Tota, uh, and uh, it, it sort of evolved over a period of years, uh, decades really. He, he um, In 1733, I can't remember the guy's name, Siegfried the First or something, uh, died, that's not his name, but he was, he was uh, the elector of Saxony, I think it was, and so there was an official period of mourning, and there could be no church music for a couple, three months or something it was, and uh, so Bach had some time on his hands, instead of turning out a cantata every week, he could work on something else, and he was a pretty astute guy, and he... Uh, started working on a Kyrie and Gloria that he could give to the successor as sort of a job application. You know, see, this is what I can do, and maybe you, you could use me in your court. He was, he was frustrated in Leipzig. And they had kind of baited and switched him when he came to work there in 1723 or whenever that was. Um, uh, they changed the entrance requirements for the Thomas Hula, and, and so the, the the kids were not necessarily as musically focused as before, and uh, so he never had good enough choir, never had good enough orchestra. Of course, there wouldn't ever be a good enough orchestra <laughs> for him, but uh, he was frustrated and uh, always looking uh, to Dresden because they had a lot of money there and a lot of super players. So he wrote this first part, the Kyrie Gloria, in 1733, and he presented that uh, to the elector with a little flowery speech. And um, that was the end of it, and and uh, it was marvelous work, and it it is the first you know um, 45, 50 minutes of the B minor, uh, and it's stunning. But we're not going to talk about it today. There's just too much of it to talk about. Um, he wrote 
a, a Sanctus for Christmas in 1724, uh, and probably in 1745, he redid chunks of the Kyrie glory in a new form. He's always remolding and shaping and taking this movement and that movement and kind of revising them. Uh, and he did this little parody of the, the Misa, it's called the Kyrie Gloria, and then he added the Sanctus in one performance. And a lot of musicologists think that was the, the moment where he thought, gee, I could I just flesh out a credo in the middle, I got the whole thing. And, and uh, he was a systematizer. I mean, he, he, he did the well-tempered clavier, and he wrote a you know, prelude and fugue in every key, and twice, and he, he did the uh, Art of the Fugue, and he did... Uh, uh, all these uh, kind of comprehensive uh, displays of what is possible uh, in, in an art form. And it probably appealed to him to try to just give his definitive word about what sacred music was to him. And so the, the Mass has all variety of styles. Um, and and uh, he actually, when he wrote the whole thing, most of it he'd written before. I mean, most every movement had been in a cantata somewhere, secular sacred cantata. And he took it and changed it, changed the text, changed the sometimes amazingly made a little micro uh, 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 change in the second theme, and suddenly it's the greatest piece ever written, instead of just a wonderful piece. And uh, he was constantly doing that. Uh, John Elliot Gardner calls it his habit of perfection. Every piece he takes, he, he works with, suddenly he finds a way to make it even more brilliant and more glowing. And so that's what this D minor really is. Um, and he wrote, you know, an, uh, uh, Benedictus and an Agnus Dei uh, to, to fill out the whole structure. But the thing that, that his sons, his sons were a little bit embarrassed by him because he's kind of old school, you know, he's doing this Baroque music and everything was galant style by the time his kids were, you know, out. And, and so he was, you know, behind the curve, they thought. And, uh, but uh, C.P.E. Bach d did a concert um, featuring his credo, his, his father's credo, in 1770, maybe, something like that. And, and he was very proud of uh, this, this center section of the Mass. And it is just stunning. It's, it's the Nicene Creed, uh, as you may know. And uh, we recite it, you know, on the big days, right? Now it's it's not, the, not the apostles, but the big one. And uh, uh, it, uh, Bach put it into nine chunks. Uh, and he did this at the very end of his life, in 1748 and 49. His vision was failing. His, his, I, he had cataract surgery in the last year of his life. He's obvious from some of the manuscripts that he was really struggling to get pen to paper at that point. Uh, but he did manage to get it finished. And uh, this credo is in, in, in a chiastic structure, a, a cross structure. He uses that in several of his... Um, cantatas and uh, masses, and actually the Gloria also is, is in the same sort of structure. So, so it's a palindrome, and the outer, the outer uh, movements match. So the, the credo, and the, I keep thinking I have to be next to that, but I don't. The, the, the credo and patrem are, are, are um, paired, and, and the confitior and expecto are paired. They're big, bombastic, uh, choral works. Uh, that have a, many musicological things in common that I, I won't bore you about, but, but they're very, very cool on each side. And then there's a solo in between, et in unum, uh, and in one Lord Jesus Christ. So this is about the second part of the Trinity, and, uh, and then et in spiritum sanctum, and the Holy Spirit, the third. So he puts those here, and then the center of his message is was made flesh, crucified, buried, and, and rose again, and will come again to judgment. So that, that center section of three is kind of the center guts of, of the um, credo. When he first wrote it, there, um, the duet here for the Ed in Unum for two sopranos included this text, the Ed Incarnatus text. So the center was going to be between the Crucifixus and Et Resurrexit if that makes sense. And so there's this pause at the end, at sepultus est, the lowest chord Bach wrote for choir, a low G chord, uh, and he's buried, he's in the tomb, and then there's silence, and then boom, et resurrexit. And that was 
the moment, the kind of existential moment was the center of the cradle. But he rethought that. I guess there was a uh, Theologica Crucis, something like that, of, of Luther, who went to the same school as Bach did 200 years old, earlier in Leipzig. And he decided that the cross should be the center of the cradle. And so he wrote a new movement, maybe the last movement he ever wrote, finished movement of music, the Ed Incarnatus. And he stole this text away and, and just had them vamp on the original text a little longer. <laughs> it's very astonishing. Both, both versions are in the, in the score, and you can see how he reworked it and added a new high A for the soprano, just kind of while, while he was going by. He just puts it, and, uh, but then he, he put this text in here, the Ed Incarnatus. And, it, and uh, it's just a love... Well, anyway, we'll get to that in just a second. So anyway, I'm talking too much already. Um, the credo, I want to say a little bit about the credo. Um, I believe, credo, in unum deum. That's the whole text for his first movement. And he, he does this amazing thing of taking a Gregorian chant, kind of chant, and uh, he takes that little theme, which is, you know, 1,500 years old. Well, at that point, I don't know, not, not that old, but almost. And then he puts it into a imitation, kind of like um, uh, Palestrina, almost. And, and then he puts it uh, with a, uh, a figured bass, a walking bass, bum, 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 underneath. So there's all periods of music are, in, are represented at once. It's like the music that was there from the beginning, as it will and ever shall be, world without end kind of thing. You know, it's kind of the, this is the music of the spheres that's always there, always present to us, if we could just perceive it. It's, it's sort of this theological message that he's giving. And uh, so you'll hear five, <laughs> this is a stunning, stunning uh, musicological or, or uh, co compositional achievement, this first movement. <laughs> it's uh, his sons would always uh, uh, brag about his eight part you know, uh, first movement, because there are seven independent voices with this pre-existent uh, Gregorian chant that he didn't make it up. He just found it, and he found a way to make seven independent voices plus the, the bass line underneath all meshed together. And not only did they do that, it's kind of like <laughs> sort of a Jeep Steve Jobs, you know, and one more thing kind of moment. At the end, he puts the, the theme in long, long, long notes in the bass, and then he puts it in the the soprano two and the alto, and then he puts in the soprano one just a half beat later, and then he puts in the tenor, and then he puts it in one of the violins, and then in the other violin, all while the bass is still going with this long theme. It's just astonishing. How could he make this? It's like a puzzle. But to the auditor, it, it's not cold and intellectual. It's, it's just amazing. The, 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 the word is strato, where, where the, 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 the uh, tension is raised as all the themes come in overlapping. It's just so exciting. So let's see, well, let's have a little cradle and I'll get my trap shut finally. It's only about three minutes long, but it is one of the greatest three minutes of music. So here's his cradle. Sorry. <laughs>
so that's just wonderful, wonderful music. Uh, and then there's a wonderful duet. Everything in Bach is theological. Everything is, you know, his, his Bible has just got margin marks and underlinings and everything. And uh, the Et in Unum, he makes a, a canon at the unison. Bum, bum, bottom, bum, bottom, off by one beat for the two sopranos to, to uh, uh, represent the unity of, of the Father and the Son. And he makes a different articulation for the one oboe and for the other, so that they're they're different, but they're uh, they're the, they're yet the same. And this is actually I don't there's this you know there was a controversy at Nicaea it must have been a very exciting time and uh, <laughs> one of the controversies it was. wasn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ninety years ago, so the but one of the controversies was uh, whether there was uh, the relationship was con consubstantialem or another one. Uh, it was the, the the Greek I think was homoousia or homoousia, being of one substance or being a like substance. Yeah, homo uh, yeah. homoousias, uh, yeah. like substance. Homoi was a neota in the word, a similar substance. Yeah, yeah, so the homo eusia people lost, and the homo eusia, <laughs> but that was a big, big deal, and so Bach somehow puts us in music on a higher plane. The, they're mystically different, but they're really the same. And, and uh, he makes this amazing uh, uh, imitation, as the one follows the other and compliments the other and sort of is the other, the two parts switch the melodies at halfway through. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous thing. And you don't need to know any of that to think it's just a beautiful piece of music. You know? But he's got all these layers, depth into it. So now comes the center of the whole thing. The Ed Incarnatus was the thing he wrote uh, later with his failing eyesight. And uh, it has this drooping motif. Um, <laughs> He's, 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 this is his uh, grieving, kind of souring, uh, sighing. Actually, originally, uh, yeah, uh, this is related to another movement that has, has that text, actually. But this was a new, newly composed, probably. So the violins in unison are doing this drooping kind of thing. And uh, all the voices have this. This is our first entrance. Uh, Ed Incarnate comes down from heaven to earth. Uh, and uh, just kind of drifts down. And many composers, this is a good thing, you know. Uh, in Mozart or Haydn, this is a warm, reassuring, lovely, and you know, it's a, it's a kind of a manger scene sort of thing, and it's in a major key, and the soprano's soaring up to Haydn. And this is a dirge, uh, because Bach for Bach, the, in, in, the whole point of the incarnation was the cross, and and he. From the beginning, this was a, a mission, you know, and and for Bach, it's already look what we've caused to have happen, you know, and and uh, so it's it's a it's a sorrowful thing, uh, and you'll hear the throbbing of the the continuo on a held note, like in the Saint Matthew Passion, or a lot of different places. There's this, and the crucifixus to follow. There's this boom, 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 and uh, at the what we'll, we'll just play it at the very end. The, the strings come fluttering down in, in imitation and settle down on a low B going on to the next movement. But it's just kind of this, the whole structure just kind of falls apart as it just like leaves kind of falling down to a, down to a, a, a resting point, uh, setting up in, in a beautiful way the next movement. So here's the Ed Incarnatus.
So just amazing how this bass line starts being very active and then just kind of disintegrates down to, flows down. Um, the, um, okay, so let's see, you uh, Nicene Creed specialists, uh, Ed Incarnatus was, uh, and was made flesh, uh, and uh, born of the Virgin Mary, um, and was made man at, at homo factus est, that was that last phrase, where the bass started moving and then there was kind of leading up to crucifixus et siam pro nobis, and crucified also for us, under Pontius Pilate, uh, uh, passus et sepultus est, suffered and was buried. That's the whole text. And uh, so now we have the crucifixus, uh, which is the center point for Bach, and um, he wrote this. This is maybe the oldest music in the whole um, B minor, as far as Bach's music goes. It's not a Gregorian chant, but he wrote this in 1714. Uh, he was at Weimar then, and uh, only 28 or 29, and um, no, not even that. Yeah, 29. And he, uh, it was uh, Weinen, Sorgen, Klagen, can't think of the other German, um, but it was uh, weeping and sorrowing and uh, sighing uh, cantata. It was. Um, uh, um, a passacaglia. So the bass line does this bum 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 again and again and again. And that's a kind of a a formula that was used in the you know six sixteen hundred, I think Monteverdi probably used it, and certainly Purcell did in his lament, Dido's Lament. Uh, it's a, uh, that kind of that uh, uh, falling forth uh, kind of thing slowly and then repeating back down is, is kind of
kind of associated with with mourning and and uh, loss and lament and and so Bach used this uh, in in only a Bach uh, only Bach could do. Um, he repeats it thirteen times, and um, the, you know what can you do with those notes? How I many? There's only so many chords you can put above those notes. Well. Bach finds a way to keep adding different chords, and uh, toward the end, uh, the last three iterations, where it's um, yeah, crucifixus et siam pro nobis, supansio pilato passus. Every time you you know an average composer composer has to cadence back in the E minor in the first boom boom, but but Bach finds a way to turn. Twice, so that it doesn't ever get back to the cadence till the third time, finally, which sets up the last, you know, six measures, I guess it is, um, uh, where it's actually buried. Passus et sepultus est. Uh, so there's this 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 uh, tension that finally is released in the last iteration, and then uh, everything drops out. This has been hauntingly kind of accompanied by strings going boom, boom, and flutes boom. <laughs> but it's really this interesting dirge, just kind of this otherworldly, disconnected, uh, disassociated view, like from above, of what's happening. It's haunting. Uh, but this all drops away, and there's nothing but the boom, 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 boom. You know, kind of the, of the continuo and the choir, the, the, the four voice choir. And it settles, as I said, on the lowest chord Bach ever scored for chorus with a a closed position G major chord just way down in the basement of of uh, uh, the sonority, and it's the passus et sepultus pastus in the tomb. But the one thing you hear right at the end is the bass line changes, finally changes, and it goes, instead of going down, it goes up. And at that particular moment, there's an astonishing chord uh, that should be from the 19th century. Uh, and uh, it leads to a G major cadence instead of the E minor, and it sets up that pause that we were talking about before, the, the existential moment. He's in the grave, it's Saturday, and then boom, it's Sunday. And, and he has let us orally be ready for the resurrect feet by beautifully changing this thing we've heard 13 times, we kind of love it, but it's, it's such a relief to hear on multiple levels, you know, for him, it's such a relief to hear that's not the end of the story. And uh, to do that musically in such a stroke is just, it's a chilling moment. So, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll play the crucifixus, and then we'll just go on, because then you'll see what he sets up, okay?
feeding our singers extra vitamins for that. Uh, <laughs>